Hello, my name is Dr. Eleanor Herring. I'm, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Design, History and Theory at Glasgow School of Art. And in this paper, I want to discuss a research project that I conducted as part of my professional training. Now, the title of the project was Cultivating Critical Thinkers, and essentially it addressed a challenge that I've noted um, as an educator, namely how to support critical and contextual discussion in a design history and theory workshop. It's been my experience that some students don't feel able to or want to contribute to the critical dimension of workshops. Others object to the tone or contribution from other students. And there's a difficulty for everyone in knowing how to address sensitive or challenging subjects. Within the field of design history, it is increasingly accepted that design education is part of a broader democratic project. The designer Massimo Vignelli claimed that education must develop critical decision-making skills that improve rather than reiterate practice. And Dr. Maya Oppenheimer also positions design education as preparing students to become contributors to society, to become active, communicative citizens. And my philosophy of teaching echoes this viewpoint. It could be defined as valuing knowledge and criticality, facilitating debate, and supporting students to develop their own critical um, position and articulate it in various forms. But what makes a critical space in an art school and how is it cultivated? What's my role as the educator leading these discussions and how can I work with and support students to develop their critical skills? Furthermore, what pedagogical strategies would be useful to support critical engagement? In this uh, paper, I set out to examine that problem in the context of my Year 3 Politics of Space course. Um, a subgroup of five student volunteers participated in three discrete sessions which addressed the weekly topics of the course. And these sessions were, in line with GSA guidance, um, delivered via Zoom. Now, the project tested out different methods of cultivating a critical discussion about public space that allowed for honesty, nuance and robust debate between participants while maintaining a safe, respectful environment. And I did this by varying the level of scaffolding around the learning experience. The first um, scheduled session functioned as an introduction to the project with all five students in attendance. And I wanted to be as transparent as I could to echo Biggs and Tang's point that good teachers are upfront about their objectives. I structured the session around a series of discussion points and I shared my findings about critical pedagogy and Paolo Freire's view that none of us possesses the truth. It's to be found in the becoming of dialogue to emphasise that there was no right or wrong answer. And as well as listening to participants' opinions on these uh, points, I also contributed my own opinions with a view to being as honest as possible much as Bell Hooks uh, describes. And at the end of the session, everyone con uh, contributed to a code of conduct, which you can see behind me. The students' perspectives about critical discussion in an art school were fascinating. Participant C noted that they often found themselves conversing in a bubble and that peer discussion could sometimes be too comforting. Participant E agreed and said that they had difficulty building a critical circle without a feedback loop. The studio for this student was so cushioned that criticism would feel entirely out of place. And one said that their studio offers an environment of like-minded people in a judgment-free zone, which was positive, while another claimed that in their studio there is a little bit of a lack of critical conversation. It's polite. It's nice. Perhaps that's a cultural thing this student uh, proposed. Participant A also added that to be critical and engage with others requires energy, which is sometimes lacking in students and staff, a point which links to Keith Tabor's argument that genuine dialogue in which we make real efforts to understand and consider the positions of others is of course possible, but it can be difficult intellectual work. 
In the second session, I tested out a structured approach to critical thinking, followed by a debrief. And I prepared a series of questions for the subgroup relating to the topic of the politics of space course that week, titled Contesting Space, Planning and Participation. And in this session, the class discussed examples where the design of a space had been contested and where debates had led to action and change. And at this session, unfortunately, only three students could attend. I began the session by leading the discussion, asking questions to the group present and inviting each participant to contribute. And besides asking critical questions, interpreting the answers and mediating between the students, I also added in thoughts and um, experiences of my own. The structured element of the workshop was expressed through my questions, in which I adopted a kind of drip feed approach to critical thinking. And I hoped that my questions would act as a form of scaffold and that by modelling critical thinking, the students would be able to succeed in the task unaided next time. Now, some participants contributed a lot, while others waited to be invited to speak. And mostly the participants' microphones were off unless they were speaking. I felt some pressure from the students to constantly talk and to ask questions, but due to having to conduct the workshop via Zoom, the conversation felt some, somewhat stilted. And watching the recording afterwards, I became conscious that my reaction was always affirmative. I asked critical questions, but they were always couched in a friendly way. I was careful to appear supportive and interested in their contributions. I mirrored their viewpoints and relayed it back to them. Now, a student's account of the session in the debrief afterwards was really revealing. Participant E said the, the session was, it was very, very nice. It was almost too nice. I don't feel like any of us here are very confrontational, maybe by nature. And that has to do with the structure because, you know, when you introduce a new question, we all express our opinion and just bounce off each other. You know, it's reflective, but it didn't feel critical. Participant C said, we're kind of like bringing up our personal examples and suggested that if we were maybe set an example of a space where there were definitely pros and cons, that would be preferable. And participant D agreed and suggested that next time I might pick something a bit more neutral. Now, these observations were really helpful. They were also quite exposing. And when planning the next session, I tried to accommodate their feedback. The objective of the final session was to test out an unstructured approach to critical thinking relevant to that week's class, which had been delivered by a colleague and addressed the politics of digital space. Unfortunately, once again, only three students attended. I began the session by presenting a neutral visual example as a springboard for discussion. And the image is a representation of the internet, which featured in the lecturer's PowerPoint presentation. It was therefore familiar to the students. And I told the students that they would have 30 minutes to discuss the image and any positives and or negatives they might associate with digital space, but that the conversation would be very much led by them. I felt hugely pri privileged to listen to that conversation, to watch how the students interacted with each other, asked each other questions, volunteered their own opinions and introduced other perspectives. The critical quality of the conversation was very high. In the debrief afterwards, participant D said, that kind of looser structure is definitely more productive than the last one we tried. Participant B said that hearing other people's opinions definitely helped me see the topic that we're talking about in a more three-dimensional way and that hearing other people's opinions sparked thoughts and inspiration. Participant E told me that the main thing I gained is thinking about what happens in open discussions. Like there's a critical discussion, is that a natural thing that happens or how much input has to be given first? The reaction to starting with a neutral image was also positive. Participant D said it was easy to get a quickly an, an opinion as opposed to um, a piece of text. 
and participant E compared it to a stimulus in an exam and said that in a non-academic uh, context, a conversation rarely loops back. Um, however, in this session, uh, the student said, you sort of force yourself to go back to the stimulus. And all agreed that it was quite easy to, to quickly ignore me. Participant B said, once I got into the conversation, it was a lot more natural to just talk and just forget about your presence. Participant E acknowledged the advantages that the small group had in terms of pre-existing familiarity with each other and the topic and attributed the success of the discussion to a relatively big shared knowledge pool. Participant B noted that the size of the group was helpful in that there are multiple opinions, but not too many, and you want to participate rather than stepping back or just listening to the conversation. Like Jack Whitehead, I started this project by asking, how do I improve what I'm doing? And as the project developed, I began to ask further questions such as, what would improvement look like? What is within my power to change? And the project led me to reflect much more deeply on what makes a critical space and how to cultivate it. Now, my findings point to the effort involved in being critical, the significance of the dynamic between the students and each other, as well as with the educator, the delicate balance between expressing polite doubt and appearing confrontational, the risk as well of creating a feedback loop with like-minded people. The findings also illustrate the inadvertent impact of inviting personal or anecdotal information from the students the benefits of adopting a more neutral approach, such as visual analysis, and the distinction between being reflective instead of critical. The limitations of this project concern the number of participants. While the student participants represented a mix of genders, nationalities, and studio disciplines, there were only five volunteers. Furthermore, only three participated at each of the structured and unstructured workshops. By chance, all three students who attended the unstructured workshop were from the Department of Interaction Design at GSA, a department with more knowledge um, than most about digital design, meaning that not only did the students know each other and were comfortable expressing their critical opinions with each other, but they were also familiar with the topic in a way that perhaps other students from other departments may not have been. And I think this limits the extent to which I can draw wider conclusions from the research. The project was further limited by the medium through which we communicated with each other. Zoom limited the intimacy of these workshops and the way in which we engaged with each other and technical problems meant that at least one student couldn't attend a workshop. The value of the project is significant for me as an educator. I learned that co-constructing a code of conduct is an excellent safeguarding activity and one that also encourages collaborative learning and helps students reflect critically on the rights and responsibilities underpinning participation in a critical discussion. Similarly, I learned a great deal from scheduling a debrief at the close of each session, which in turn helped me craft the next session. Now the student response to the different ways a workshop can be scaffolded confirmed the advantages of an unstructured approach to learning, particularly in small intimate groups where participants know each other and the subject is one that they feel comfortable discussing. Engaging in a critical discussion without intimacy, without trust and without familiarity is, of course, more challenging. Out with the parameters of this research project, teaching large student numbers is increasingly the norm. In an ideal scenario, our class numbers would be greatly reduced and our workshops would be more well, they would be smaller, they would be more intimate. However, whether it's possible to overcome the limitations of the sector is doubtful. Nonetheless, this project has been a valuable exercise in deconstructing 
the building blocks of learning and teaching. If you have any questions or any comments about this research or would like to give me some feedback, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Please email me at e.herring at gsa.ac.uk. Thank you very much.